Scarface's Tony Montana is one of the most iconic villains of all time. Even if you somehow manage to miraculously avoid the movie, you've at least seen the iconic poster hung on the walls of frat boys the world over. It's not hard to see why Tony Montana has hooked the public consciousness for going on 40 years. Say hello to my little friend. In America, first you get the sugar, then you get the power, then you get the women. The second night to the bad guy. He exemplifies the American dream. His rise from humble beginnings to attaining money and power beyond most people's wildest fantasies is somewhat inspirational, even if the methods by which he acquired it are questionable. While the Miami Beach mansion, sugar booger binges, and shootouts aren't exactly universally relatable, his discontentment with where he was in life and willingness to do whatever it took to improve his position is. Tony epitomizes the excess of the 1980s, a decade of greed and glamour that celebrated wealth and power above all else. He embodies the dark side of the American dream, exposing the corrupt underbelly of society and the dangers of unchecked ambition. In many ways, his story is a cautionary tale about the dangers of overindulgence and the consequences of not knowing when to stop. I'm going to try and unpack his psyche and explain why I think Tony Montana is one of the greatest villains of all time. Every compelling villain needs a motivation, a desire, something pushing them forward. For Tony Montana, that happens to be money, power, and women. After Manolo fails to pick up a girl using a interesting approach. Take a look over there. You see that man there? Watch that guy. I gotta style him. I gotta watch my phone here. He's gonna stick his tongue out to that girl. Oh, look at that. Yo. Tony explains what he wants out of life and how he plans to attain it. You gotta make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the woman. But why does Tony want these things? Why? 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 The money? That's a no-brainer. Miami mansions and a mountain of Florida snow don't pay for themselves. But why is Tony so obsessed with power? I suspect it's because agency or the feeling of being in control of his own destiny is critical to Tony. And given what he's been through, it's perfectly understandable. First, he lived under Cuba's authoritarian government. Then he was incarcerated, only to be sent off to the States where he was then held in a detention center, not knowing when or even if he would be released. That's bound to make anyone super protective of their autonomy. For Tony, this manifests itself in a deep mistrust of any authority figures, especially when he feels they're attempting to give him command. I'm giving you orders, look. Orders? You giving me orders? I gotta call money again. Fuck you, man. You don't tell me what to do, here. Yeah? That takes us to Tony's final desire. Women, or rather, one woman, with the exception of his sister. And don't worry, we'll get to her later. The only woman Tony has eyes for is Elvira. Hey, I need a guy who's stealing his balls, Tony. Huh? A guy like you. That description fits Tony to a T. And boy does it take giant steel balls to come to your drug dealer boss's house for the first time. And I fuck his girlfriend like he isn't standing right there. Tony being Tony, of course his approach isn't subtle. He flirts the same way he does everything in life, with all the grace and subtlety of a sledgehammer to the scrotum. Who else would open with? How long did you go looking? You got a beautiful body, beautiful legs, a beautiful face, man. All these guys in love with you, man. All he's got a look in your eye like you haven't been fucked in a year. After she tells him that even if she was blind, desperate, starved, and begging for it on a desert island, he would be the last guy that she lets into her pan. This is his takeaway from the interaction. A chick he's with. She like me. She like you, man. How do you know? I know. The eyes, chico. They never lie. Now I consider myself a pretty confident guy, but if I heard that from a woman, I'm thrown in the towel. I guess that's what separates me from Tony Montana. I don't have that extra strength resilient root. Really. Quick PSA to the young and impressionable watching. There's a thin line between resilient riz and sexual harassment. And if you find yourself on the wrong side of that line, you might find yourself on the wrong side of someone bigger, stronger, who also doesn't take no for an answer. So, tread carefully and don't drop the soap.
Personally, I don't think Tony is all that interested in Elvira, at least not as a person. Sure, she's a gorgeous woman, but this is Miami, baby. The streets are paved with gorgeous women. What I think he's really chasing is the unobtainable. Less her, per se, and more what she represents. She's the boss's girl. She's the forbidden fruit. She's the type of girl who wouldn't look twice at a guy like Tony, unless he was a somebody. So, somehow if he can manage to land her, then surely he must be a somebody, right? For better or worse, when Tony wants to do something, he just does it. With zero hesitation or analysis of the pros and cons, this is simultaneously what makes him great and what ultimately destroys him. He's a walking example of the phrase, fools rush in where angels fare to tread. Whenever Tony's faced with an opportunity, he doesn't assess the risk like a normal person would. He just jumps in with both feet and hopes for the best. A good example of this is when he's asked to pull off an assassination in the detention center. Rather than asking any follow-up questions like, is this guy well connected? Does he have any family likely to go on a revenge quest? Or even, is he known for hiding weapons? He instantly agrees and responds. I kill a communist for fun. But for a green card, I'm gonna carve him up real nice. While this approach worked perfectly in the detention center. Him blindly agreeing to do the pickup with the Colombians almost resulted in him getting carved up real nice. There's a bunch of Colombians coming in Friday. New guns. They say they got two keys for us for offers. Pure cop, hotel in Miami Beach. I want you to go over there. And if it's what they say it is, you pay him and bring it back. You do that, you got five grand. Any other sane person in that situation would ask for further details, so they could accurately weigh the risk versus the rewards. But not Tony. He sees only the potential upside. Shortly after expressing interest in Elvira, Manolo reminds Tony of the risk that he's taken by trying to get with the boss's girl, and that this time last year, they were in a detention center, and he should be happy with how far they've come. To which Tony responds, You'll be happy. Me, I want what's coming to me. Oh, well, what's coming to you, Tony? The world, Chico. And everything in it. Tony is just one of those men for whom enough is never enough. But this insatiable appetite is what drives him. It's what made his meteoric rise to the top of the Fiesta flower game possible. Despite being a professional assassin and a drug dealer, Tony has an ironclad sense of morality. I never fucked anybody over in my life. Didn't have a cop. You got that? All I have in this world is my balls and my word. And I don't break them for no one. Do you understand? He doesn't respect underhanded dealing or deception. Which makes sense, right? Tony's a straight shooter who tackles all obstacles in his path head on. And for the most part, people trust and respect Tony for this. I like you, Tony. There is no lying in you. As an employee of Frank's, Tony was for the most part loyal, despite never truly respecting his boss. That guy's soft. Look in his face. The booze and the concha tell him what to do. He never tries to seize control or betray Frank. Though he does overstep his authority by agreeing to purchase 150 kilos of Bolivian marching powder from Sosa each month without first consulting Frank. You made a deal for a fucking 18 million dollars without even checking with me? Are you crazy, Montana? Are you crazy? Oh, you're Frank. Take it easy. Oh, my ass! This exposes a fundamental difference in their worldviews and what they want out of life. Frank is content to maintain his current lifestyle, therefore is much more risk averse. What about that? What about Gaspar Gomez? What is he gonna do when you start moving 2,000 kilos? Fuck Gaspar Gomez and fuck the fucking Diaz brothers! Fuck them all! I buried those cockroaches! While Tony is hungry and willing to risk it all, so of course he favors a more aggressive expansion strategy. We gotta expand the whole operation. Distribution. New York, Chicago, LA. The two eventually reach an impasse and decide to end their partnership with Tony starting his own independent operation. Sometime later, Frank makes an attempt on Tony's life, having two hitmen try to kill him while at a club. Tony ends up taking a bullet to his shoulder and narrowly escapes with his life. Tony and Manny Corner are terrified Frank at his office. 
Even though he's already fairly confident that Thrank was the one that ordered his assassination, he still wants to be certain before killing the man who gave him his start in the game. He does this by arranging for one of his men to call and say, We fucked up, he got away, while Tony is in the room. If Frank didn't hire the assassins, then he'd just be confused and ask the person on the phone, what the hell are they talking about? But when he does pick up the phone, he pretends it's Elvira and confirms Tony's suspicions. Hey Frank, you a piece of shit. Tony, what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about, you fucking cockroach. What are you talking about? Come on, you listen to me, huh? Do you know what a hasa is, Frank? That's a pig. That don't fly straight. Neither do you, Frank. I stay loyal to you. I made what I could on the side, but I never turned you, Frank. Never. While Tony Montana isn't exactly a criminal mastermind, this is one of the scenes that confirms that he's not just balls with no brains, as he's capable of setting up a trap that Tyrion from Game of Thrones or Stringer Bell from The Wire would be proud of. Tony takes Frank's attempt on his life very personally. Baby, please. Oh, I won't kill you. Oh, Christ, thank you. Get off. Take. No, shoot that piece of chip. No, 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 no! I've always wondered how Tony can feel like he has the moral high ground in this situation. I mean, he was trying to play hide the pickle with his boss's girlfriend. How do you think he was going to respond? Tony's moral code is truly tested when Sosa orders him to assist in the assassination of a political opponent, while initially on board with the plan. I don't give a fuck. It's him, man. I don't care where you blow him up. Don't tell me when, okay? When Tony learns that the politician's family are also going to be in the car, Tony tells him to stop and can't bring himself to be involved in the murder of an innocent mother and her children. What the fuck is that? Hey, come here. She told me she took the kiss in the other car. She did, boss. She did every fucking day. <coughs> I don't know what's going on. Hey, hey, no fucking way. Hey, no fucking way. That's it. I'll be the asshole. Matamos at the solo. When Alberto attempts to proceed with the plan regardless. You think I killed two kids and a woman? Fuck that! I don't need that shit in my life. Tony blows his brains out. To this day, I still can't decide how much of this is attributable to him sticking to his morals versus being high out of his mind. Either way, stopping the assassination was a costly decision that puts him at war with Sosa. You a long time ago, you fucking little monkey, not to fuck me. Hey, hey, who the fuck do you think you're talking to, huh? You wanna fuck me? Who the fuck do you think I am, you fucking dumb boy? Do you want to go to war? Come on. Do you want to go to war? We'll take you to war, okay? Tony resents the fact that despite being at least as wealthy as most of the other patrons of the fancy restaurants he finds himself in, they clearly believe themselves to be superior to people like him. He points out their hypocrisy, that they aren't in fact the morally upstanding citizens that they believe themselves to be. Tony understands that behind every great fortune there is a crime, and the way they absolve themselves of their crimes is by pointing their fingers at the supposedly worst criminal and saying he's the bad guy. You need people like me. You need people like me so you can point your fucking fingers and say, that's the bad guy. So, what I make you? Good? You're not good. You just know how to hide. People like Tony are only a symptom of a wider systemic problem. He knows that most of Miami's wealthy elite either profit from or turn a blind eye to the tons of baby powder moving through their city, therefore are complicit. The most obvious examples being Jerry the banker and the crooked cops on his payroll. Tony doesn't pretend to be a good guy and he doesn't respect the fact that they do. Tony doesn't trust anyone, not even his best friend Manola. I'm your partner, okay? You're not gonna trust me with that kind of thing. Who the fuck are you gonna trust? Join your party. Bullshit, man. Okay, don't talk to me about trust, I don't mind. Despite the fact that if it wasn't for Manolo, all that would be left of Tony is a stain on a motel bathroom wall. Who put this thing together? Me! That's who! Who do I trust? Me! 
This inability to trust is one of the things that caused Tony's downfall. If he trusted Manny to handle the Seidel bomb money laundering situation like he wanted to, Tony wouldn't have been arrested for criminal conspiracy and forced to carry out the assassination mission for Sosa. His lack of trust comes to a head when Tony finds Gina at Manny's house, dressed in only a bathrobe. He completely loses it and kills Manny on the spot. In defense, if my best friend, who I explicitly warned to stay away from my kid sister, had her half naked in a bathrobe, I'd be pretty pissed too. I don't know if I'd be pissed enough to execute him on the spot like a rabid dog, but I'd be none too happy. When Gina tells him that they just got married and that they planned on surprising Tony with the good news, Tony just seems stunned and numb to the situation. He can't believe what just happened. When Chi Chi and Ernie manage to get them home, Tony is visibly shaken. It's only when he's finally alone that the gravity of the situation hits him, and it hits him like a prime Mike Tyson. Up until now, I've implied that Tony pretty much has zero self-control, and that isn't strictly 100% true, as there is one example of him wanting to do something, but ultimately deciding not to. And I am of course talking about him wanting to bang his sister. Just look at his reaction when he first sees her. I don't know about you, but I sure as hell don't look at my sister like that. Ah, uh, you're being over dramatic. He's just stunned by how much she's changed since he last saw her. You say. What about when she pulls the oh stepbrother routine? I can't stand for another man to be touching me. So you want me, Tony, huh? That isn't the response a brother who doesn't secretly want to bang his sister makes. I'm not sure where this sits on the moral scale. Do I give Tony props for having the strength to stop himself from screwing his sister? Or do I remove points for him wanting to do it in the first place? Now there's a question for the philosopher. Putting aside Tony's potential Lannister-like feelings for his sister for a minute, I think that Manolo's description of Gina goes a long way in explaining his overprotectiveness for her. Right now, you happen to be the best thing in his life. The only thing that's any good, that's pure. So of course he doesn't want you out there mixing with those people, growing up to be like him. In some ways, he still sees her as the innocent child she was before he left. The fact that his mother is ashamed of him and is desperate to protect Gina from Tony's corrupting influence hurts Tony deeply. Yet despite his best effort, he can't help but infect her. A massive part of why Tony Montana is still so iconic is his final shootout scene. We all love a good shootout scene, and when it comes to them, it doesn't get much better than this. Out of his mind on a potent combination of the devil's dandruff, adrenaline, and the embers of what I can only assume is a rapidly wilting erection, Tony becomes a god of war. Okay. Do you wanna play rough? Okay. No. Say hello to my little friend! He went out in a blaze of glory. He didn't try to run or beg for mercy. He died how he lived, facing his problems head on with zero regard for the consequences. Throughout the entire fight, he's taunting numerous attackers as he mows them down. You fuck with me! You fuck with the back! And even when he is hit, he seems, if anything, more determined to kill them. Almost as if his sheer will and defiance were all that was keeping him upright. But every bill comes due eventually, as Tony's luck runs out when he's killed by the skull, aka the badass Terminator looking dude with the shades, who manages to sneak behind Tony and get him with a clean shotgun blast to the back. I can't help but think, what if Manolo was alive? He would have had Tony's back, literally in this game. Maybe he wouldn't have died like this. I view Tony Montana as somewhat of a tragic figure. He's like a dog chasing its tail. He doesn't realize that even if he did catch it, he wouldn't know what to do with it. That's what it's all about, man. Eating, drinking, sucking, Come on. snoring, then what? The entire movie, he chases wealth, power, and only when he finally gets it does he realize that it's hollow and meaningless. Tony is a complex character, deeply flawed and full of contradiction. On one hand, he's a compassionate and loyal friend who cares deeply about his family. On the other, he's a ruthless killer who's willing to do whatever it takes to get ahead. This paradoxical nature is what makes him so fascinating. You never know which Tony you'll get. His the world is yours mantra really resonates with me. We all love Tony, 
for the same reasons we love Alexander the Great or Napoleon. He's a man who's never afraid to go too far or take too much. In a world that often tells us to take just one piece of candy, it's refreshing to see someone who grabs the whole bowl. Intellectually, we know the Frank Lopez's of the world are probably right. The guys who last in this business are the guys who fly straight, low key, quiet. The guys who want it all. Chicas champagne. Flash. They don't last. But even if we know it's not going to end well, even though we know they will inevitably fly too close to the sun, it was fun to watch them cry. But that's just this idiot's opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments. What do you think makes Tony Montana so special? Feel free to suggest any other villains you'd like me to cover. And if you like the video, which the fact that you're still here suggests you do, like the video as it lets me know the kind of videos you guys prefer and lets me know the type of villains I should focus on. It's a sacred night to the bad guy. Come on. The last time you're gonna see a bad guy like this again.